Hello again. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is a session that I'm really, really looking forward to here. Uh, email deliverability for the rest of us. Uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, if you have any type of chatting you would like to do during this session, any kind of um, kudos, thumbs up, um, and anything along those lines, feel free to put those into the comments section. And more importantly, uh, Steve, who is here, uh, is going to be fielding questions at the end. So put that into the Q&A section. Um, and at the end of the um, presentation, we'll be able to get back to those as well. So I want to introduce uh, Steve Robinson here. Uh, for those who don't know Steve from his previous years of presentations, he's the founder of Brilliant Metrics, who's a uh, business, business, digital marketing agency in Wisconsin here in the United States. And uh, they use Mautic uh, not only for their clients, but also internally for themselves. Um, before moving into the marketing world, uh, Steve was a software developer, and he's one of those people that just completely geeks out on the technical side of digital marketing, as well as doing a lot of strategy work. So uh, today's session is going to apply both uh, apply both to the technical users and as well as to marketing people in depth. So um, I'd love to introduce uh, Steve Robinson, and uh, whenever you're ready, Steve, uh, go ahead and uh, take it over and make your presentation uh, available for everybody. So thanks Thank for joining us, Steve. Thank you, David. That was a beautiful intro and I appreciate uh, the opportunity. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and get some visuals up. Excellent. So today we're talking about email deliverability and uh, uh, this topic is uh, can be very unapproachable to marketers uh, and can get uh, even confusing for the technical side of the house as well. So when we think about email, you know, we have a number of metrics at our disposal. We have opens, we have clicks, we have unsubscribes. But the metric that's missing is deliveries. We have no idea how many of our emails actually hit the inbox of our audience because it's at the receiving side's discretion on whether they want to accept that email. So this presents a problem for us as marketers, because if we're ending up in promotions, if we're ending up in spam, if our email isn't getting delivered at all, we can't be effective. And worse than that, it goes and messes up those other three metrics you see on the slide. So let's take a look at this from the platform, the receiving platform side, whether that's Google Workspace, Office 365, uh, a Barracuda firewall that's sitting in the way of some corporate email system. What are their goals? Well, they really have two goals. One is they want to limit spam, unsolicited, unwanted email in their users' inboxes. And two, they want to prevent impersonation because impersonation leads to phishing and other dangerous security situations. So they have an arsenal of tools or weapons at their disposal. And what we're going to do today is go through that arsenal, not, not that arsenal, this arsenal, of what tools they have in their disposal that they can use to keep that bad email out and keep the good email in. And by looking at it from the perspective of the receiving platform, we have an opportunity to see what countermeasures we as, as Modic users and Modic admins have to uh, make sure that our good email, because we're all good guys, right? Our good email is getting through. So the four main weapons in the arsenal of an email provider to prevent the bad stuff and let the good stuff in are server blacklists, sender validation, domain reputation, and lastly, message inspection. We're going to go through each one of these in depth. So let's start with server blacklists. When it comes to a receiving email system, it's about trust. Who do I trust? And there are uh, uh, two types of uh, server lists out there on the internet, blacklists and whitelists. Blacklists are also called RBLs or real-time blacklists. What these are, are they're, uh, uh, on the whitelist side, they're reputable email service providers and large, uh, large volume brands. So if you have your Modic instance hooked up to Amazon SES, there are many email providers that accept Amazon SES as a whitelist entity because they know their quality standards are high enough. Same is true for SendGrid and any of the other systems that you might use. On the other side of that, we have blacklists. And blacklists are IP lists that servers, where, where servers have essentially been caught doing bad things. 
And usually that bad thing is they've been caught sending an email to a non-existent email address. You ask, well, how do you catch somebody sending an email to a non-existent email address? Well, this is where the idea of honeypot addresses come in. So this is how a honeypot address works. Essentially, the good guys, the ones that are trying to keep the good email in and the bad email out, go and create a fake bio page or release a fake list of email addresses out on the internet somewhere. The bad guys have a bot that goes and scrapes for those emails. So now they're building a list of emails that they've just found out on the internet somewhere. Sometimes they provide some context around those emails in order to build a list that is supposedly targeted at something. Then they either go sell that list or uh, use it themselves. And people who are buying these large email lists to go and send email um, indiscriminately will buy a list that has a bunch of these honeypot addresses on there. So at this point, all the good guys have to do is sit back and wait and listen for any emails that are sent to these non-existent people's email addresses. Because if these email addresses aren't real, they never signed up for anything. Any email they get is unwanted, illegitimate spam. When they get an email like that, they inspect the email, they look in the header, and they say, well, this is the, uh, this is the IP address or the server that this was sent from, and they throw that particular server on the RBL. It's then the responsibility of anybody legitimately sending email through that RBL to get it off of there. Is the system foolproof? No. Every once in a while, legitimate uh, uh, server will end up on this blacklist. But usually, if you're on a blacklist, it's because you sent an email to one of these honeypot addresses. So how do you avoid this? Well, it's easy. You just don't buy lists. Uh, there are places for legitimate email lists if you really if you're going to go down that road and certainly list quality plays a role into this but my suggestion is operate on an opt-in uh, in an opt-in mode whenever possible and uh, don't use uh, automated systems you rely on for deliverability to send uh, cold or unwanted email Other things you can do, though, is uh, be selective on who you partner with and how you partner for your SMTP connection in Zetamotic. Uh, we are uh, fans of Amazon SES, which is, uh, I don't believe they have a paid tier, but a number of the other providers that Modic has built in connectors for do have free tiers. What you'll find with those free tiers, though, is that the provider is a little bit less quick to get those free tier servers off those RBLs. So you'll end up on a blacklist more often if you're using a free provider or a free tier for your SMTP. You get what you pay for. The more um, the the paid the paid variety of these SMTP connectors will do a much better job of getting any of their shared servers that their 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 users are sending email through off of the server blacklists than the free tiers will. You can also go the dedicated IP route. But it's really important that you understand the trade-off that comes with a dedicated IP. On the one hand, you have complete control. No bad actors are going to be sending email through your server getting you on an RBL. If you get an RBL on an RBL on a blacklist, it's your fault. On the bad side, though, not only do you have to pay extra for a dedicated IP, but you have to warm up that IP address because chances are it's not on any whitelists either. And uh, in many cases, it, uh, it will be viewed as suspect until it has a chance to warm up. You also don't know what the previous owner of that IP address did with it. And there have been instances we've run into where a dedicated IP was garbage out of the gate. It was already on a bunch of RBLs. Finally, if you do go the route of getting a dedicated IP, you're going to want to set up some monitoring with it. Here are two services we've used in the past to monitor um, our IP addresses for those dedicated IPs to make sure that they are not on any RBLs. Okay, so coming back to the arsenal of weapons that a receiving email system has to keep the good email in and the bad email out, server blacklists are pretty simple. Don't buy lists, pay for your SMTP, pay for your mail, mail service, don't use a free one. And if you have a high enough volume that you can, you can keep that IP address warm, and and happy and you really want that control go for a dedicated ip 
but only if you're also willing to pay for monitoring because it's your responsibility to go and dispute when you end up on that RBL list. Moving on to the second weapon, and that is sender validation. Phishing attempts are getting to be way, way more common these days. And so receiving email systems are being a little bit more picky about whether or not an email is legit coming in. And what many people don't realize, even some people that are avid email marketers or you know, active in the modern community, technically anyone on the internet can email anybody else from any email address. There is no technical limitation that says that you have to own that domain to send email from it. So it is up to the receiving email system to decide, is this email legitimate or not? Now, there are two ways that you can send signals to that receiving system that you own that domain and you authorize, you're authorized to send email. And these are two acronyms that get thrown around, but a lot of people don't actually understand what they mean. They're not that complicated. SPF and DKIM. When we talk about SPF, we're talking about a, uh, from the technical standpoint, a DNS record, a simple TXT DNS record that lists all of the servers who are allowed to send email. Now, if you look on the screen here, included in that, you can actually include another SPF record and all of its servers. If you get too big and you put too many servers in here, it starts to get get confusing to the receiving server and it doesn't doesn't follow it very well. So you don't want more than like two layers of recursion here where, where your, your SPF refers to somebody else's SPF, which refers to somebody else's SPF. Um, but uh, it really is just a list of who can send email. And then the last part right here says what to do if that email sending server isn't on the list. For the less technical people, this is a public record of the servers that are allowed to send email from the domain. That's all it is. It's not rocket science here. Now, SPF is great, but technically it can be spoofed. It can be circumvented. It's not easy, but it can be circumvented. And so a while back, uh, DKIM was introduced as a much better, more secure way of ensuring that email is authorized. The way DKIM works is it uses cryptography. So as the uh, marketer who owns the domain, you go and publish uh, uh, a key that is unique and it is a cryptographic key that can unlock essentially a puzzle inside every single message. That puzzle sits inside the email header. So every email that comes from the domain should have a DKIM key in the header or a DKIM uh, uh, challenge in the header. And if this key can unlock it, then the email is legitimate. Uh, a hacker is unable to create that same uh, uh, puzzle inside of a header if they want to, to fake the domain. So their emails will fail. This is the structure of a DKIM record. Um, and uh, again, it is nothing more than a public DNS record. The idea here, if you control the DNS for your domain, you control the domain and you can decide who can send email from it. So how do you get this set up? Well, I would say that you're probably going to want to reference the support documents from your email provider. I could go through the instructions today, but it's going to be different on where you access what, the, what needs to be in that SPF record and what needs to be in that DKIM record for every provider out there. Most of the providers have really great tutorials because their users stumble on this every single day. You can also enlist the support or services from your email provider. So if you're more a Modic user and less a Modic admin, less on the geeky side of things, many of these, uh, particularly the top, or top tier ones like SendGrid and some of the other ones that are a little bit more expensive, again, you get what you pay for, they will help, their support team will help make sure that your DKIM and SPF are set up correctly. And finally, if you're a marketer, but you've got an IT department, pawn it off on them. Now, that's great. We have DKIM and SPF records set up. How do I know they're right? Well, like everything else, you're going to want to monitor this. The easiest way to monitor it, monitor it is through a system called DMARC. So again, we've got three acronyms here. SPF and DKIM are the records that you post into your DNS. DMARC is the technology or the standard for monitoring. What DMARC is, is it's nothing more than a set of instructions 
that you again publicly post through DNS that tell receiving servers how to handle email if it either does or doesn't check out with SPF and, and DKIM. And um, once you have that set up, um, the, the reporting will start coming in as email is delivered. Now, you don't want that reporting going directly into an email inbox because that's how it would normally be received. You want a layer in front of that. You want a provider in front of that to go receive all that feedback on whether your emails are, are authorized or unauthorized. And uh, the two vendors that we've used in the past are uh, a free service from a Postmark app. This was recently acquired by Active Campaign, but uh, it's still free, and they seem they 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 have said they intend to continue to honor it as a free service. They also have a paid service that we've used as well that's excellent. And then Power DMARC. Power DMARC also has a lot of tutorials and reference out there for how to get this stuff set up correctly. One other benefit of doing this is that these reports will also include any email that's being sent from your domain that doesn't pass. So that gives you two really important pieces of information. One, what other email systems are sending email on your domain? Because email that fails to pass DMARC will hurt your domain reputation. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what other systems need to have DKIM and SPF set up in order to improve your deliverability? And two, are there any bad actors sending email on your domain without your knowledge? We recently had a client that for whatever reason, some group decided that their domain was going to be their go-to for sending spam. And they sent massive amounts of spam from our client's domain. We were able to use these tools to narrow down exactly who it was. And then the, the last thing that you should probably know is there's actually a way within the DMARC specification to go and ratchet down what gets through. So you can say, if it doesn't pass SPF and DKIM, don't let it through. Now you need to make sure everything is, everything's all tight and tidied up and be monitoring these reports before you do that. But it's a sort of a nuclear button to go and prevent those bad actors sending email on your domain from tanking your domain reputation, which we'll talk about in a moment. So the second weapon in email providers' arsenals are sender validation. And the key here is get your DKIM and SPF straight. Uh, great documentation out there on whoever it is you're paying to deliver your email. And then set up DMARC monitoring, because without it, you don't know when something goes sideways. The next thing I want to talk about is the one that's probably least understood when it comes to deliverability, and that is domain reputation or sender rating. There are hidden metrics behind the scenes that you can't see. And so let's just hypothetically talk through a scenario here where there is a domain spamstock.com and spamstock.com likes to send emails about penny stocks that you need to buy this week. Obviously, nobody's asking for this email. There's also modic.org, which only sends really relevant, very valuable community information about the modic ecosystem and community. Now. Google has been receiving emails from these two through the, for their various users for a while now, and they have given spamstock.com a hypothetical rating of 3.6, and they've given modic.org a hypothetical rating of 9.8. Office 365 has similar ratings, but different ratings behind the scenes for these two domains, as does Barracuda, one of the major firewalls on the corporate side. All three of these entities have some feel for how good or bad these two domains are. And it's different because it's based on different algorithms and different scoring. And most of that scoring is top secret. So included in the factors that they use to determine the sender rating for a given domain, things might include uh, a bounce rate, how much email that is sent by modic.org bounces versus how much email that is sent by spamstock.com bounces. What's the open rate? Remember, these people operate uh, e email uh, web clients. So they know exactly how many people are opening messages or just sending them right to, the, right, to, right to the trash before they even open them. So if emails are getting open, that's a signal that it's good quality content. And uh, the same is true for unsubscribe. If people are clicking unsubscribe, unsubscribe, unsubscribe in all these emails, well, that's a good signal to these email providers that stuff coming from that domain is not wanted. Click-through rate is another good indicator. If people are clicking on these emails, then that means that they're valuable content. 
If they're reporting spam, that means it's not valuable content. And then finally, if it's a, a platform like Google where you have a promotions tab, if more than one user moves that content to a promotions tab, that's a signal to Google that email from that domain belongs in the promotions tab. All of these signals, these signals that are sent by the engagement of users on these email platforms are aggregated. And at the end of the day, they provide a score for that domain and the quality of the content. The trick is that score is private and they don't publish that score. Now, there's an exception and I'll get to that in a moment, but for the most part, you're flying blind. So what do you do? Well, the first key is to implement an email hygiene program. An email hygiene program is nothing more than, at least in the Modic world, because the Modic handles bounces pretty, pretty effectively. There are other platforms you have to handle bounces. But uh, for, for Modic, the key here is really identifying those users that are not active and kicking them off your list. That doesn't mean you need to delete the records from Modic necessarily, although eventually you probably want to do that because they end up being cruft. But you at least want to get them off your list. What this does is it distills your list down to your active people. And if all you are sending email to is people that actually take action on that email and engage with that email, all those metrics we just covered, all of them improve simultaneously. So let's talk about what that email hygiene program would look like. When we set this up for clients, we set up a simple segment and a simple campaign. The segment looks for current subscribers who haven't been active in the last X number of months, haven't updated, haven't been updated in the last X number of months, and weren't added in the last X number of months, where X is the same number down the road, usually some numbers somewhere between six and 12, depending on the frequency of email, how bought in the client is on this email, email hygiene business, and how aggressive we really want to focus on, on, on sender rating. Um, the reason why we have to have all three of these checks in here, and you can see on the screen, there's an example of literally that segment from Modic, is we want to check if they're active in the last X number of months, um, because that means they've clicked on something inside of an email, or they've opened an email, or they've engaged. We want to know if they've been updated, because maybe we updated the email address. So any records that have updated the email address, we don't want to just assume, you know, we, we want to get them back in and get them engaged. And then we want to uh, check and make sure that they weren't added in the last X number of months because people who were just added obviously haven't engaged in the last, last X number of months. So that's a pretty simple segment. Now here you have an option. You can send a re-engagement email and we use this tactic a lot with clients because they get all squeamish about taking people off of their list. So it's a, it's a nice little last chance. Hey, looks like you're not really engaged with our content. We're about to take you off our list. Click here if you'd rather stay on. And you just link that to a landing page that says, great, we'll keep sending you email. The mere act of them clicking on that link then gets them out of the segment. And so they get out of the campaign before that 15 days hits and we, put, we blank out that subscription. If you put this in place, your sender rating will skyrocket because now everybody who's on your list are the people that are actually engaging. And you're sending emails a lot more frequently than once every nine months or six months or 12 months or whatever your window is. And so you don't have to worry if people are just not engaging with one or two emails, they will maintain that, uh, they, they, will, they will not fall into the segment if they're actually real people receiving your email that want it. The next thing that you want to look at for sender rating is optimization. Continuous improvement in your email marketing program is going to drive up that level of engagement and drive up that sender rating and keep you out of the promotions tab. Content that is engaged with, that is opened consistently, that is read, that is clicked on, sends signals to the platforms that it's quality content and ought to go in the inbox. Finally, monitor. And I, that's like a recurring theme through this, right? But people don't necessarily know that these tools exist. Um, I said the sender rating is secret. It is. Uh, Google sort of reveals a little bit of it in their Postmaster Tools product. So if you aren't using Postmaster Tools, you definitely need to go out and get a Postmaster Tools account. Now, a quick little note on Postmaster Tools 
it uh, doesn't really give you any information unless you send a high enough volume of email because they don't want people gaming the system and figuring out exactly what 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 reduces the sender rating. Um, but uh, if you send out even a small volume of email, you'll see that your your email sends will pop up in in Postmaster Tools, and you'll get some feedback. And that's true whether you're sending B two B or B two C, because a lot of companies run Google Workspace, and that gets reported here too. If you see trouble, anything but a high rating, because that's all they give you is low, medium, and high for your sender rating. But anything but a high rating inside of Postmaster Tools means there's trouble. And that means that there's trouble across all the other sender ratings that you can't see on the other providers. And you need to go and take a look at what's going on that you're sending email to people that don't want it. OK, so when it comes to domain reputation, the uh, uh, the three countermeasures you can apply to make sure that you are the good email that's getting through are an email hygiene program, optimizing for engagement, and then monitoring with Postmaster tools. If you do those three things, your sender rating will stay high and you will get in the inbox and not the promotions tab. Now, the last thing and the thing everything everybody automatically defaults to when they think about you know, deliverability and staying out of the spam box is the messages themselves. But strangely enough, that's actually the least of your concerns because a the rules there here are easily googleable, easily easy to Google. There's tons of people who've written about this stuff in the past, and they're not that hard to follow. So when it comes to content, you know a lot of receiving systems put some sort of a Bayesian, fil Bayesian filter behind the scenes, which is a fancy way of saying they keep score on how many of these uh, trip lines you've tripped over, right? And again. There's tons of content out there on how to not, not trip on this stuff, but basically include more text than images in your email so they can feel confident in their ability to scan it. Don't put racy or suspect words. You know, we all know what those are. I had a client once that was a B2B client that, that marketed to pharmaceutical companies about pharmaceutical issues and standards, and that was just miserable getting those emails through. <laughs> um, don't you know avoid over punctuating the subject line and and the the most important one is include an unsubscribe link and a physical address in your emails a lot of these providers are us based so they're really looking for those two items to for compliance with can spam and another little fact you might not know is that if you send email through a platform like amazon ses or sendgrid there is a bulk tag that appears in the header of the email that you can't remove that tells that receiving system, this is bulk email, look for an unsubscribe link. And so if they get that bulk tag in the header of the email, which is behind the scenes, and don't see the unsubscribe link, guess where your email's going? Spam folder. So always include that unsubscribe, unsubscribe link. You don't need to call attention to it, just make sure that it's readable and on the, on the, on the email. And of course, with all things, there's a way to monitor or there's an app for that. In this case, most of the tools that'll tell you whether or not your emails are presenting correctly, Litmus and Email on Acid being our favorites, will also tell you whether or not that email is probably going to trip some of the major spam filters. So if in doubt, test. Um, it can't hurt every to test every once in a while and just make sure that your email is good. OK, let's review before we turn this over to questions. I've been talking a little fast, so you get a little extra time for questions. So make sure you're popping those in the Q&A here. The first weapon of choice of email providers to prevent the bad actors from getting in are server blacklists. So the solution to this is simple. Don't buy lists, or at least don't buy cheap lists. Pay for SMTP. Um, so pay for your provider. Don't use one of the free ones. They, they end up on the RBLs often. Uh, and if you're sending a high volume, consider a dedicated IP, but make sure you get monitoring. Sender validation, DKIM and SPF records are not optional. They are mandatory. Get both of them. The details of how to set those up vary from platform to platform. So I don't want to get in, I couldn't get into the details here, but your email provider has great tutorials. And if the tutorials don't work for you, they'll often help you through their support channels to get this set up right. Always set up DMARC to go and monitor and make sure you got it right. On the domain reputation, an email hygiene program will do will work wonders for improving your sender rating and getting you to the inbox instead of the promotions tab or spam folder. 
Uh, in addition to that, optimize for engagement. The better experience you create, the more likely you're going to be in the inbox. And then finally, monitor, monitor, monitor Postmaster Tools being your friend here. And on message inspection, be smart. You can Google around, watch some other YouTube videos, go and figure out exactly how to, how to not trip a, a spam filter, um, but then test if necessary, especially if you're working in one of those edge industries where it's hard to get the email just right so it'll go through. And with that, I'm going to hand things over for questions here. David, do we have any questions? Um, that, that was incredible, by the way. Is um, I would like if you can do two things, one of which, can you drop that information that you have on the screen into the chat uh, sure. so people actually have your uh, LinkedIn as well as the, uh, the slides? Uh, yes. Slides were in incredible. And after you do that, Steve, if you can go back to that arsenal um, slide so we can leave that up during the questions there, because I think that uh, people need to try to capture this and digest it a little bit more. Uh, it, it's such a bulk of so much information and the slides were absolutely fantastic. So hopefully we can leave it here for just a little while while you do that there. Um, so we do have some questions. Uh, um, before we move on to Robin's question, I have a um, what may be a simple one. Uh, if if I don't have a dedicated IP address, do I still need to monitor for the RBL blacklists? Um, the answer is uh, no. Um, generally, your email providers are going to be doing that monitoring for you. If they aren't, you have the wrong email providers. And two, you're sending out through a pool of servers. And when you send out through a pool of servers like that, you don't really know which server is going to be sending the next email. And so you wouldn't be able to know which IP addresses to go check, even if you, you know, looked at an email that was sent through through your provider this week and then gone, went and looked up that IP address, it's going to change. So you're you're playing a game of whack-a-mole at that point. All right. And and I'm I'm curious, you mentioned Amazon SES and SendGrid. Uh I, does it does it make a difference which kind of email delivery partner I'm going to use with um, you know Mautic instances? I mean, like, does that mean um, am I going to get better results with Amazon SES or SendGrid or Mailgun or anything like along those lines? Is there something better results that I'm likely to have? You know, the short answer is yes. There are subtle differences between these different platforms, and if you go and read their marketing materials, some of them will say they do a far better job of keeping off blacklists. Um, at the end of the day, the best thing that you can do is look and see what the standards or, or expectations are of users of that service. So what, it, you know, what sort of spam do they tolerate, you know, spam complaints do they tolerate on that platform and go for the vendor that has the most stringent spam complaint you know, level, right? So if you get above a 1% spam rate, you're out versus somebody that says you can get above a 5% spam rate, you're out. Well, guess which one's going to have the better deliverability? the one that sets the bar threshold at 1%. Now, I will say we've been partnered with Amazon SES for years and haven't had any problems with deliverability or RBLs with them. That isn't necessarily the experience that we've had with other vendors, but um, your mileage will vary and, and just pick a reputable provider that has good controls in place and kicks the bad actors off. All right, wonderful answer. I appreciate that in a big, big way. Uh, question from Robin here. Uh, for Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, and a number of other services, uh, the simple act of just adding an unsubscribe link in that email just gets you right into that promotion. Folder. <laughs> uh, how do you how do you get into the inbox uh, if you end end up you know always showing up in that promotions yeah. folder? This is uh, this is the million dollar question, right? So um, the catch twenty two is if you don't put the unsubscribe link in there, then then you're very likely to end up in the spam folder, depending on how you sent that email. Um, it really comes down to the two things I mentioned: that email hygiene program and the continuous improvement and iteration. Uh, you look in your if you're a Gmail user, you look in your inbox. There is commercial email that ends up in your inbox, and it gets there because. It's the kind of email that people engage with over and over and over again. It's the really good stuff. So you need to be on that list of really good stuff. And that comes down to that domain rating. So um, just continuous improvement in the uh, A-B tests of your emails so that you are really rocking that experience and uh, um, making sure that um, you have that email hygiene program and you're only sending to people that are enjoying that experience and you can get there. 
I'm hoping that uh, people get that uh, one slide down where you showed uh, exactly, you know, you can request the slides. You already dropped them to the chat. I noticed um, the, the information there. And if you can switch over to that last slide, for people that are watching this on YouTube, they uh, may want to be able to retrieve the information this way. Thanks for doing that, Steve. Yeah. Um, the uh, That one slide where you showed how to do hygiene within uh, Mautic was exceptional. So I'll be digging into this video a couple more times on YouTube. Uh, there's a, a question that comes up from Julio, which is apart from the Google Postmaster, you know, specifically for the Gmail accounts, is there any other tool that you can recommend or know of for checking other domain results? You know, we uh, we have a tool that we we use internally, and you know, I'd be willing to uh, um, get this out there. If you sign up for the slides, I'll turn around and send you this too. Um, it is a, a Google sheet that we built that will, uh, you put in a domain name and it'll go out to the various other uh, prov security providers and check the reputation on the domain. Now, if a domain has a poor sender rating, sometimes it'll pop on those other security tools as well. Sometimes it won't. But the other thing I didn't mention that can get you uh, get your email to not deliver is if there is a security issue with your site. If your site gets hacked, it will cause an issue there. And so we we generally pop our clients' domains in here and run a check at a minimum once a month across the various security tools plus postmaster tools to go and see what's there. But I'll tell you, most of these providers keep the, the, the sender rating close to their vest because they really don't want people gaming it. Google's the only one I found that'll actually publish it. And when they do publish it, it's low, medium, high, super high fidelity. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't even know about that uh, Google Postmaster. So that was uh, one of the many tools that I learned about in this one here. An another question from Julio, is it is it healthy to have several uh, DKIM records from different SMTP providers yeah. uh, in your DNS settings? Yeah, you can have an unlimited number of those because when the email comes through, it actually says which DKIM record to use to go and check. So as many SMTP providers, as many different ways that you're sending email, you want to set up DKIM records. And the exact details of that DKIM record is going to vary from vendor to vendor to vendor. So um, if you, and that you want that for your corporate email as well, because one of those other signals on that sender rating that should have been on that slide that wasn't is um, what percentage of your email qualifies as SPF and DKIM. If you, if you are, are really on the ball and have every system that sends email on your behalf, having a proper SPF and DKIM configuration, uh, that sends a good signal to these providers about your domain and your sender rating improves. So uh, yes, this, you, want, you want it everywhere you can get it. I guess uh, something that is related to that is also a question from David here. Uh, if you're using an email server, uh, you know, your own email server. Are there any things you can do to assure um, deliverability? Um, if you are using your own email server, and this is a, this is like 301 level stuff, right? So you, 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 you if you, if you literally have a, a, an SMTP server, you, you maintain that is your relay for Modic, um, uh, security, 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 because there are lots of people out scanning the internet looking for those SMTP servers and working very hard to get in them to go and send spam. And it just takes one hack and now you're on every RBL out there. So if you're sending through your own server, security is key. And then you're back in the same place with the dedicated IP. And that is with, you know, MX or with your, um, uh, you're going to monitor for RBLs. Uh, and you're going to want to take some time to warm up that IP address and, and get the internet used to receiving email from there because you have a, you have a double whammy there. Not only are you sending through um, uh, a new server, right, that maybe maybe people aren't familiar with, but that, that server's never really sent email before. That IP address has never really sent email before. And so receiving systems are going to be a little wary of that at first. And you're going to want to warm up that IP and 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 get it get it on some some neutral lists of IPs that are known to be uh, okay for sending email. Great, great. Uh, another one that comes up is, uh, can you tell us something about uh, BMI, uh, BIMI, the uh, brand indicators for message uh, identification, which is the new email standard that's emerging uh, pretty quickly. 
And uh, I like how Julio says it, mentioned something about it besides the high cost to get it. <laughs> I, I don't know very much about, uh, about BIMI and I would be, uh, I'd be the wrong person to be, uh, to be speaking authoritatively on that. All right. Uh, for people who don't know, it's an emerging uh, new standard that lets you add a brand logo uh, to messages that are authenticated uh, through your domain. And uh, it's on the rise right now with a lot of the big brands mm -hmm. uh, that I know of there. So, um, well, if there's no other questions, I can tell you this is uh, something that is uh, worth watching again and again and again. So, uh, Steve, thank you very, very much for this. Thank you to everybody else who's uh, joined in this session. And um, we'll see you uh, another time, hopefully, Steve. Uh, um, I'll be at your presentation for the years to come as well. So, Well, thank you very much, David. I appreciate it. And it was uh, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for all the great questions from everyone. Yeah. All right. Cheers, uh, Steve. Thank you, everybody.